to episode number 360 of the Plain Talking UK podcast. I'm Carlos, and in this week's show, fights break out on a United Airlines flight, and it's nothing to do with Brian Coleman. One airline receives a five-star COVID rating, and a certain airline sells rather a lot of airline meals. In the military news this week, lots of planes are falling apart all over the sky with pilots ejecting left, right and centre. And an F-35 shoots itself in the foot. And Cambridge Marshall Aerospace is expand or ex- exciting uh, some changes in the, uh, expecting I should say, some changes in the near future regarding its C-130J contracts. And I've only had half a beer. I mean, so, we're not live if you just want to do it again. <laughs> so joining me, join, we are live, joining me this week. As always, is the master of ceremonies in the PGK Master Stereo Studio. It's Matt Smith in the Master Stereo Studio. How much? You say you're on the first can, right? Yes, on the first can. Just, just wondered. And before, before we go anywhere, Matt, massive round of applause for last week's show. Why? What happened as last in, week? Did I do something as in interesting? Your breakfast show. <laughs> Honestly, it's not my breakfast show. I was just sitting in for for Neil. I uh, I know, but, I know, uh, I know. You you were, yeah. you were just you were just you were super sub, super sub. I was, yeah, absolutely. Do you know what? It's probably the most fun I've had, um, fully clothed in a very long time. If I'm honest, it was uh, it was an awful lot of fun actually, and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I, I can't. I'm I'm very much looking forward to doing it again. It has to be said. Um, I've got uh, got a couple of dates in the diary actually, but we'll perhaps talk about that at the to- at the end of the show, shall we? Uh, as I mean, we do you, normally. You've done very yes. well. Yeah. Everyone. No, thank you. Very thank much you enjoyed very much. Yeah, it was good fun, wasn't it? Hmm. Yeah. And joining us as well this week across uh, the country in his glorious Buckinghamshire studios, it's the master of everything masking tape, and it is the legend of cable time management. It is, of course, Neville Bounds. Hang on a yes. minute. You can't Hello get away there. with that. hope you're all well. <laughs> yes, thank you for that, Carl. Um, yeah, it's been a um, bit of good week here. Um, not much in the way of travelling, obviously. Um but um, yeah, actually, as of next Thursday, uh, my company allows us to travel uh, sort of within the country. So that's quite nice. So we'll be driving around to see some customers to remind ourselves what they look like again. Wow. Yes. Will, you, will you be able to cope, Nev? I mean, will it, no, will it be a little bit not. overstimulating to sort of Absolutely actually be meet someone in person? <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, and then spent some of the uh, early part of the week uh, changing BA flights again. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, no. Because of holiday dates changing and general government rules weirdness and this sort of business. But uh, again, BA on the phone were absolutely tremendous. So I was able to... What are, one of those voucher things, and uh, but no, we're all back to uh, where we should be, hopefully. So, can't really ask yeah. for more than that, can you, Nev? No, 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 all good, excellent, good to hear, uh, have you on as always, Nev. And joining us from across the pond, it is uh, the world's favorite military um, aviation, well, professional, I should say, it is of course Armando. Oh, that's great, Carlos. The only word that's accurate in there is aviation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, I wasn't on the show last week. I was supposed to be, and uh, we are nearing our final integration on one of the aircraft that we have, one of our DC-3s out there, and that does not come without a good amount of crises, um, mm. and Friday afternoon was one of those things where we thought we had things tidied up for the for the week, and just wasn't the case, and uh, we navigated yet another crisis as you're as you can imagine, building an airplane is not easy, um, especially when you're dealing with outside vendors and some international parts and things like that. But uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm actually not here right now, as uh, the chat room has noticed. Nev is here. Therefore, I'm actually not live. I've right. just pre-recorded You're on tape. Right. Okay. all of my segments. Yeah. Of course, absolutely. We'd expect I will pre-record with... my, my real-time commentary. Of course, absolutely. Very, very, I'm very good at it you are too. I mean, it's like nobody would notice, uh, let's be honest. Can I just say, actually, just reading uh, in, in the in the chat room here, guys, thank you very much for the love. I'm really appreciating it. It's uh, the lovely things you're saying about uh, about what I did on Saturday. Um, yeah, if anybody's interested, doing it on Good Friday and Good Monday, 12 till 3, if anybody cares. Uh, uh, so uh, do feel free to uh, join in. Uh, but uh, yes, I- indeed. I-, I assume you weren't listening, obviously, Armando, because it was half past silly o'clock where you are. 
Yeah, I'm still waiting for the link for the recording. Oh yes, no, I do. Oh, actually, I do have those now. So yes, I will. I will. Actually, share Richard them. Adams, Richard Adams in the chat room, Matt, notice that on your uh, breakfast show, when you which you done last Saturday, you did manage to slip in that aviation related <laughs> song. <laughs> Now, there's a good reason for that, and uh, mainly because when we finished the show on Friday, uh, Carlos and producer John very kindly stayed on the call, and we sat down and we planned all of the music for um, for the three hours that was going to be going out on Saturday morning. So uh, it did. The music was fantastic, but I really cannot take very little. I can take almost no credit for it whatsoever because, as I say, it was all picked for by John and Carlos, and Carlos very much insisted that there was a spot of danger zone in there. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, do feel free to uh, recommend some other, uh, I, not the not the obvious ones. We want some slightly off the off the chart things that we can sort of slow in. But uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Excellent. So, weekly roundup time. Um, some of you who follow us on social media may have noticed that on Facebook, I posted a little picture on there uh, this week. Just a bit of sort of a fun, you know, midweek fun <laughs> caption. This kind of. I mean, I uh, took picture. I took one look at this and thought, no, this doesn't look like fun. Uh. So, for those of you watching in the world of YouTube, this is the picture that I posted on our social media site, Facebook, and uh, it is, uh, I think that is a, that's a 150 in it, uh, Armando, if I'm right, that is a Sestan 150, just looking at the back. Yeah, no, that's, that's a 172. That's oh, a 172. Uh, so 172, and it's got, uh, well, how would you describe this uh, for our listeners, uh, Armando, this particular aircraft? Oh, man, I would call that an, uh, an unapproved modification, or perhaps a... I think I saw one uh, caption that said pioneering 101. Yeah, so, that was from Brian. Yeah. We let's had, see. Um, For our audio listeners, it seems to be a four by four inch uh, piece of wood uh, with apparently zip ties to the <laughs> strut, which is looks like it's experienced some trauma. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure it's very aerodynamic. Yeah, we had uh, some great comments uh, on, posted on Facebook. We had uh, Steve said, uh, he said, Dr. Stefan Armando fits skydiver handholds to their new jump plane. That was good from uh, Steve. Uh, Sasha said that if that thing flies, I'm using that technique on my next patient with a broken leg. Uh, Jan Hubner said, uh, hope he or she is a better pilot than mechanic. <laughs> I like that one, Jan. Very, very good indeed. But I, I mean, would you risk taking that one up, um, Armando, on a, on a flight? I don't know that I would. And I'd fly a lot of things. And uh, I think this one is beyond me. I've flown a lot of experimentals, and this is, uh, I don't know about that. Perhaps we should post that one to Sean, uh, Sean Van Hatten. Perhaps that's one that he could. He uh, would fly it. Yeah. He would fly it and develop a test plan for it, actually. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Moving on to the chat room, we're going to say a quick hello to everyone who's joined us in the live YouTube chat room this evening. We've got uh, Lee Davies. Hello to you, Lee. Richard Adams, uh, Nick Codling, uh, Dr. Steph's also in there as well. Uh, Masha's in there, Captain Cruz, Lane Street. Obviously, we have to have Lane. Uh, Phoebe Stern is also in there. Tony S. Uh, Pilot Pip's in there as well. Hello to you, Pip. Uh, welcome. Um, Mark Priestley. Hello to you, Mark. Miles High is also in there as well. Our main man, Micah, is keeping an eye on things with that blue spanner. So well done to you, Micah. So welcome to everyone who's joined us in the YouTube chat room this evening. Don't forget, if you are listening to this as an audio show and want to join in the crazy fun that is the YouTube chat room, uh, don't forget to find us on YouTube. Just search for us, YouTube, uh, Plain Talking UK. Just look for us on there, Plain Talking UK. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that bell icon, which is right next door, to be notified when we're live and recording new episodes, just like I'm sure many of you had when your little um, notification pinged on your device just before we went live. So if uh, everyone's ready, we've got some commercial news to do, uh, to, to do this week. So we are going to start the show as we do each week with a rundown of the week news from across the world and the uk so if all the team's ready yeah yeah ready, yeah let's go
So kicking off this week's first story, this one is for all our Australian and New Zealand listeners. This one comes to us from multiple sources, Sam Chewy, uh, TravelDailyMedia.com, SimpleFlying.com, Legislation.gov.uk, uh, CommonBusiness.Parliament.uk and also the BBC. Headline, Australia amends biosecurity laws for travel bubble with New Zealand. Uh, so... We'll do some on the UK travel rules too, but steps towards eliminating quarantine for travel between Australia and New Zealand have been made this week. 12 months ago, Australia introduced a ban on its citizens leaving the country due to the pandemic. Uh, Exemptions can be issued. They are not uh, easy to get. However, on Monday, Australia amended its Biosecurity Act to allow people who have been in Australia for at least 14 days to go to New Zealand without having to apply for an exemption to leave the country. Speaking with the press, New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinta Ardern said that more time was needed to set up a two-way bubble with Australia and deferred an announcement of a start date until the April or until the 6th of April. Uh, she said that that time was needed to set up the framework of a final agreement with Australia. In a statement, Auckland Airport said that it can separate its international terminal into two self-contained zones. One zone would be a health management zone for arrivals needing to quarantine. The second would be a safe travel zone for arrivals from countries with which New Zealand has formed travel bubbles. Back in the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, good old Bojo, has announced that overseas holidays will not be permitted until May the 17th at the earliest. Legislation which includes the penalty of £5,000 for anyone travelling abroad was voted on by MPs this week. Uh, This legislation will be in place until it's reviewed or until the 21st of June this year, a date I think many people are looking forward to here in the UK. Okay. Hey, Nev. Oh, yes. <laughs> Just a bit. Yes. Uh, and I think there's been a lot of um, misinformation going on, various media channels and wires that I've seen, uh, people making it up as they go along and not actually reading what the government legislation is at the moment. They're making all sorts of uh, promises and all sorts of denials about where the holidays will be of, uh, able to be taken this year, etc. Well, let's see what happens. I think that's the only thing I would say. And I'm sure that uh, if they can open up certain corridors or countries for travel, then they will. Um, but we obviously, no one's in the mood for another lockdown and all the other stuff that went on at the back end of last year. I so did read a report, actually, Nev, on the news this week. And there was a couple of people on there who had said that they would quite gladly pay a five thousand pounds fine just to go on holiday wow yes well it's probably a bit bit much isn't it but then that's not really um uh in the spirit of what the whole thing's about Mm. is it it is a global pandemic ladies and gentlemen so you know whilst um half the adult uk population has been vaccinated uh, many many other countries in europe haven't and other parts Mm. of the world also so um let's see what happens but um yeah it's it's a moving target and people just got to understand that i think yeah so matt you've got uh An interesting story from Ryanair this week. I have, yes. Uh, And my story, as I say, story number two. So it has to be only... This is uh, from a site I've not come across before, actually, which is the aviationpros.com. And the headline is Ryanair pledges 2,300 flights a week from Britain to Europe during the summer holidays. So Ryanair vowed on Wednesday to return to a near-normal summer schedule by this year, uh, flying 2,300 flights a week from Britain to Europe. The Irish discount airline said it will be running the flights across 480 routes and is also launching 26 new routes, including from London to the Greek islands of uh, Sanatori and Zakynthos this summer. The schedules uh, mean that Ryanair would be running about 80% of its usual capacity, which, frankly, given what's going on, is quite impressive. Uh, Chief Executive Michael O'Leary said that because of the government's successful vaccine rollout, Britain is on track for a reopening of European short-haul flights. Uh, He also said passengers may be asked to wear face masks on Ryanair flights until 2022. I would imagine at this point in time we're planning to continue to require mandatory face mask wearing on board our aircraft through the remainder of this summer schedule and next winter's schedule too he said i mean 
I mean, I do get it to, you know, I accept that the face masks aren't perhaps comfortable. I must admit, I'm kind of getting used to them now. I mean, it doesn't, no, but genuinely, it does. I mean, like when I first no, we started are. wearing it, uh, wearing the mask and stuff, it used to be a real, not a bone of contention, but it was something that I certainly didn't enjoy doing. And now, actually, it's just so commonplace now. I don't even bat an eyelid uh, to, to wearing the mask. And of course, there are several countries, um, especially sort of Asian countries and things, where actually a lot of people chose to wear a mask anyway. And I mean, you know, who who were looking the more you know the the smarter out of all of us now, really, with with stuff like that. I mean, do you, do you have like a cloth mask or anything, Nev, that you you wear when you're going out, or have you stuck with one of these medical grade jobbies? Yeah, I've got a couple of different options that my company has provided us all with a, a mask, which is rather nice, with mm. some branding on it. Um, and then I think Brian Coleman sent us some aviation ones as well. So I wear that one occasionally, but normally I wear the disposable ones. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I've, yeah. Got, I've got the, um, he sent me a, a Star Wars one that I absolutely love. That That is my favourite mask. That's the one that goes through the wash and I try and get back out of circulation, as, into circulation again as, as quick as I can, actually. I must say, actually, of course, because a lot of places aren't accepting the cloth uh the cloth ones are they i mean i'm you know unfortunately the last couple of weeks i've been spending a lot of time going up to hospital with with mum obviously and um yeah they they're they're very much insisting on the on the medical grade ones obviously yeah a lot of the uh, manufacturing companies that i um i go to during mm. the day for my day job um they started off with the cloth masks spent a fortune on supplying their staff with the cloth yeah. ones and now they've all gone and they're um they've got to wear these the, the blue the medical ones. grade ones yeah, yeah. Well, it's been interesting to see the evolution of this because uh, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic when I was um, still at the airline, our company gave us these black masks that had the vents on them. And it wasn't for a couple of weeks that the CDC came out because I think a lot of these um, overseas companies were selling these at, at a pretty good pretty good price so i think my company bought you know a couple hundred of them mm. and issued two to each employee thinking they were going to be reusable and all that and then we realized well the vents are not not good right because they're still breathing out the virus um but actually just coming back from california this week i was uh, impressed with american airlines they um, there was uh, one gentleman with a just a neck gator single um single ply like toilet paper um single ply neck neck, neck gator um and they made him, uh, they wouldn't allow him to board. And he created oh, wow. a tiny bit of a fuss, but then they said, well, we'll be happy to give you masks. We have some back here. And, you know, the whole thing was just sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, taken care of. But, uh, yeah. but it's interesting here in the U.S. to see, you know, out in California, complete non-issue, like you're saying, Matt, everybody's wearing a mask. Yep. Um, you know, it's just a just a matter of life. But here... Uh, in North Carolina and some of the other states that I've been to, it's just uh, not a thing. So, but you know, that's without getting into into politics and personal <laughs> rights and the differences in the U.S. Yeah, within the states. Yeah, it's 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 a say it's 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 a funny subject, isn't it? It's one that you you sort of perhaps feel a bit uh, cagey, almost sort of talking about, really. But uh, you know, at the end of the day. Uh, whatever it is that gets the job done. Captain Cruz is saying mask-free travel only allowed in the cargo hold. I think that's a, that's a sound <laughs> bit of advice there. Thank you. That's definitely the way forward, I think. Definitely but, a chilled uh, air in there. Yeah. Mm. Indeed. So, Refreshing. Nev, the, uh, the next story, Nev, is a bit of a shocker. I, I think they're um, must be trying to get some money. Yes. Well, it's all about the... Uh, the cash at the moment isn't trying to preserve cash. Uh, this is on the chaviation.com website and also featured on the bloomberg.com uh, website. Uh, it says that British Airways is considering selling the building near London Heathrow that houses its HQ as the switch to home working during the COVID-19 pandemic means that the carrier may no longer require so much office space. The move would be part of a plan to allow head office staff to split their time permanently between home and office after the pandemic, the Financial Times reporting, uh, citing an internal email. Uh, British Airways has hired property consultants to evaluate the sale of the complex called Waterside, which houses uh, 2,000 employees. The building was completed in 1998 at a total cost, including the land, 
of £200 million pounds sterling. Uh, many of us are based at Waterside and it's not clear if such a large office will play a part in our future, Stuart Kennedy says, and he's the uh, airline's director of people. Uh, one of the very few positive aspects of the pandemic has been how well employees have adapted to remote working, he said, adding, we'll want to consider what the ideal office layout is and for, for the future uh, will be. Uh, perhaps it's less, uh, fewer fixed desks and more casual meeting areas and we need to consider colleague well-being too. Well, BA, which is uh, part of the IAG group, has sold art, retired old aircraft and cut thousands of staff in a bid to survive the decimation of aviation brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Stuart Kennedy said that it was still early days and that the sale of Waterside was just one of the options available to the carrier. Waterside's future, which is also IAG's HQ, was already uncertain certain as it would have to be demolished if a third runway was eventually built at Heathrow. Well I've actually been oh. to the Waterside HQ a couple of times uh, in the last few years and it's a pretty nice building I've got to say um, but um, I have spoken to a couple of BA uh, ticketing staff over the last uh, couple of weeks who have been changing my flights I think for about the fifth time and they're all working at home and whilst it's convenient for many people uh, a lot of people have also said that they do miss their colleague interaction and if I'm anything to go by I'm certainly missing that with my work colleagues as well and whilst working at home is convenient for some of the time uh, there's no doubt about it that uh, working with your work colleagues colleagues in the same building uh, there is a lot to be said for it so let's see what happens uh, but uh, of course we have to bear in mind that the pandemic will be at an end at some point and therefore they will need to get back to you know fairly normal operations so let's uh, let's see what they do i think it's done a, what it has highlighted actually is how adaptable uh, businesses can be if they need to be doesn't it i mean the thing is is we're all going about our business despite the fact that you know we're having to work from home or whatever and i, I think certainly for the company that i work for um i think they've been pleasantly surprised that actually uh, the alteration you know because there are a lot of challenges to working from home as well isn't there let's be honest you know there are perks obviously uh, to to that as well but there are it, it does also present you with new challenges working from home but the one thing that has been um very sort of prevalent certainly for the company that i work for is that actually productivity has been unaffected by you know, by, by the fact that people have adapted to working from home but we we were having a a chat obviously um we had a zoom call this week actually which was exactly the same uh sort of like we, we just sort of talking about the thing and the one thing we've all said is that we are missing it's not so much that working thing it's the socializing and i mean i mean nev i know for in, a part of your job uh, a huge part of it is meeting customers it is going to those um those big exhibitions obviously for example when it comes to to things like sound tech and stuff like that i mean that's a big that's a big part of of what you do isn't it sort of interacting with customers and and you can't be face-to-face -face interactions for things like that yeah it, it is very difficult and we've had a year of it now and mm. i think that because there is a way out of all of this um, people have to look about how, what they're going to be doing and certainly the conversations i'm having with customers of mine is that most of them going yeah actually the hybrid working model would be quite interesting to try so doing some of the work at home some of it at the office but a lot of the people are saying oh, we just want to get back to the office now we, we are desperate yeah. to uh, uh, reconnect with our colleagues again and yeah. i certainly feel that way myself with where i'm traveling a lot of the time and uh, with without actually interacting with my colleagues physically or being in the same space or going out for dinner with them or whatever it is uh, it, it's a big loss that, that there's no two ways about it so uh, agree uh, i think every company will be adapting differently that's mm. what i think well, I'm Steve, on the, I mean, Stephen h is missing something matt in uh, the okay. chat room what's that um our listener Stephen h is 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 missing uh the free coffee and tea and coffee he's having to pay for his own coffee at home <laughs> right okay i mean that yeah I, I, you know first world problems and all that <laughs> um it's uh now I'm, I'm under obviously because the situation has been again not wanting to get too political but obviously the situation's been quite different um certainly you know the approach in, in the u.s has been quite different to the one here in the uk i mean i mean 
I say, are you looking forward to sort of going back and, and socialising, interacting? But I mean, really, there hasn't been a massive change for you guys, has there? Mm. It depends. Uh, so I think I think the economy forced a lot of companies to uh, reduce their physical footprints, and now they're realizing the advantages of having virtual work environments. Um, many, many people. Um, like some of our listeners in the chat room are, you know, didn't really have a choice. There's such a huge infrastructure here in the United States that a lot of people didn't have a choice but to continue going to work. Um, but uh, it's kind of all over the place here in the States. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. Uh, one thing I do want to bring up, though, actually, is uh, Captain Rick Bell. First of all, obviously, get back to Armando on your text because that's just rude. And uh, second of all, <laughs> uh, he doesn't miss a trick, does he? Long story short is I forgot yes. to change my background uh, and I've got the same background as I have had for the last couple of weeks. So if anybody would like to send me a picture, the WhatsApp number, plus four four seven five seven two two four nine one six six. That's plus four four seven five seven two two four nine one six six. Do please feel free to send me a picture and I promise you I will change the background right now as you, you know sorry <laughs> armando armando over to you oh, for the next story apparently it needs to be aviation related i'm being told in my ear and this one is <laughs> this one is all about those dreaded no tams isn't it armando oh oh my goodness we've talked about this so many times and how many mishaps come back in the accident investigation and not even mishaps i i've been you know subject to this myself where i turned on to a taxiway that was apparently closed one time at at uh, Atlanta Hartsfield International Airport, and they said, "Hey, don't you check the notams?" And we all just kind of chuckled. But uh, <laughs> yes, from AIN Online, uh, a bill to improve the NOTAM or the Notice to Airmen system and incentivize expedited airport projects cleared the U.S. House uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee on Wednesday. The Notice to Airmen Improvement Act of 2021, House Resolution 1262, uh, calls for a government and industry task force to review and make re recommendations to improve the presentation, accuracy, and completeness of the FAA's NOTAM system. Under this bill, the FAA would create the task force, appointing members from the business and general aviation communities, human factors, specialists, safety experts, air carrier representatives, and labor representatives. The bill would require the task force to review the system and report its recommendations within one year. Now, this bill has drawn a uh, strong backing from the National Business uh, Aviation Association, NBAA, and the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, AOPA. Uh, according to them, to the uh, Jim Kuhn, the Senior VP of Government Affairs and Advocacy for AOPA, he says, establishing an FAA industry task force to develop recommendations for improving long overdue changes to these safety of flight notifications will be very welcomed by pilots. This committee also approved the expedited delivery of Airport uh, Infrastructure Act of 2021, which would make uh, early construction completion incentives eligible for federal grants through the airport improvement program. Uh, Representative Garrett Graves called the, the bill a win-win for airports and taxpayers, uh, saying this legislation takes uh, successful existing road project programs and implements the same efficient practices to get the airport improvement projects completed faster. Now, Matt, um, so our our listener our listeners watching so our watchers on uh uh youtube will see i sent you a file and this file is representative of a flight release so this is a typical flight release this particular one is in the american airlines format uh, this is what you get before every single flight and as you scroll through it you know you've got some essential information in the first couple pages page one is your route your filing information then uh, second page is uh, fuel planning uh, some flight time information then it goes a little bit into uh, mel or, or minimum equipment list items and then some uh, some weather in pages three and four and then from page five all the way to page 36 is all NOTAMs. Now this is everything from airspace NOTAMs, airport NOTAMs, unlit towers, taxiways that may be closed, uh, instrument approach amendments are in there, uh, military airspace that's gonna be active, unmanned aircraft airspace that's gonna be active, communications NOTAMs, perhaps one frequency is gonna be out. And you have to dig all the way through any of this. So for example, 
uh, in this particular flight plan that I sent or flight release, um, the alternate airport is uh, George Bush Intercontinental down in Houston. There are four pages of taxiway closures. And that, that may be a, a, a 30 foot taxiway or a hundred foot taxiway or an entire length taxiway. And it is just incredible the amount of information that you have to sift through to uh, to just do a flight. And if you're doing, you know, a lot of our listeners are regional airline pilots or part 135 pilots, you're doing seven, eight legs. Sometimes I've, I did 10 legs a day. Um, that's a lot of information and there is a high potential to get tripped up and miss one tiny thing like taxiway whiskey romeo is closed uh between uh runway 10 right and taxiway alpha or something like that um so anything to improve the faa's notam system and the way it's presented uh is is oh my goodness it's just uh it's absolutely needed out of those 36 pages then i'm under how many pages would you actually say roughly actually it would apply to you as a as a pilot well the i mean the legal answer is all of it oh yeah <laughs> no i mean i initially you 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 want to know the weather you want to know your your route your alternate how much fuel you need uh your block fuel as in um the company determines how much fuel needs to be on that aircraft uh, before you leave there and that's uh, to get to your intended destination plus your reserves plus your alternate destination plus any contingencies so they'll tell you you need 7,000 pounds of fuel you know before you leave the chocks um, so fueling weather and the route information if it's not automatically fed into the aircraft's um, flight management system then you, you need to hand jam it in there um, and then what what I usually did is I looked at, I reviewed the notams for the airport that I was departing, and then during the flight, uh, then you're skimming through the notams for the airport that you're intending on arriving to, um, because otherwise you, you know it's just a you know twenty pages of light reading. Twenty pages of light. You make it sound um, like it's a, like it's a sort of like a standard thing. I mean I mean as I say it's like. I mean, there's is is there a, an argument though for actually making sure that, um, as you say, I suppose the legal answer here is obviously all of it is completely relevant to the route that you're planning. But I mean, there must be some some stuff in there that isn't like urgent or really really important. Um, you know, correct. And there's a lot of things that don't apply to you, but you don't know what that is. So, for example, when it comes to instrument approach procedure amendments. Uh, it may say um, that in between the in between the two cycles where the approach plate was published, the the uh, controller of that of that approach uh, of that instrument approach may have said, if one of these items is unservice, unserviceable, such as a glide slope or maybe the weather um, reporting system, then you must amend uh, the minimums or you must amend the procedure to. Uh, laterally to to be a little bit different than what's already published in your in your electronic flight bag or your hard copy approach plates um and that in in that example that i sent you so let's say you're coming into atlanta and you're going into uh, into runway eight left and the tower says hey you know eight left is uh, there's an aircraft not on the runway can you accept nine right and you're now you're just shifting over you're quickly putting in the approach into your uh, fms and to your navigation and now if you have time you have to flip through the uh notams real quick to that to that page for the amendments for nine right to see if there's anything that would change what's published on the on the plate it's it's very tedious but there must be a better way of presenting that information so that you can you know because as you say if if when you're arriving into there you want to go to that bit just to check which taxis way, ways are, are open and closed but i think that's unreasonable to expect you to be able to remember that from the outset of your flight if you see what i mean Absolutely. So there I, must I, be I, there must be a better way of presenting the data to you I there must be if, and uh, i i'm wondering if this if your aircraft was a cars equipped for example would there be a way of if there was that last minute runway switch like 
you know, tends to happen at U.S. airports quite quite a lot. Um, that the uh, tower or somebody in the local area controller could not send a an ACARS message to the aircraft with some pertinent NOTAM bits of information. Not the whole lot, but just you know things which you you might want to know about if there's taxiway closures and that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now some of those runway changes specifically happen right at the last minute, so the the company's dispatch isn't even aware that it's happening. Um, what now with electronic flight bags and most uh, regional and uh, major airlines have them connected throughout the flight to Wi-Fi, so you will get NOTAM updates uh, as you're flying along. So that's that's helped. And uh, programs like Sky Demon and Four Flight, uh, Garmin Pilot, some of these um, newer programs do a, a fantastic job for a general aviation or a business aviation pilot to when you select an approach for for instance or just select an airport it'll come up with a little red flag at the top and say hey there's three applicable notums to this approach that you just picked or to this airport that you just picked um so that is a great way to present it but that is entirely a private um that's the way that that program and that company presents it it's not an official faa uh, way to do it so i'm not uh, Matt, I'm so you're com you're completely right in that there is a better way and we'll hopefully the uh, House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee will let us know in one year what that is. True. OK. I mean, I, I mean I'm mean, i sort of trying to think from so, it, you know, obviously a lot of people know I was a coach driver, obviously, before I, I do what I do now. And uh, I mean, if I was hit with all that information about essentially what you're receiving there is information about the fact that the A4 is currently closed. <laughs> Um, now, you know, I am 120 miles away from the A4 and there's a very, very strong chance that by the time I get to the A4, as an example, let's say the road that goes past, you know, the the, um, uh, the Madame Two Swords, the, the bit there, uh, you know, there's a very good chance that that will have changed by the time that I arrive there. And presumably that's the same uh, as far as these NOTAMs are concerned. There's, it's all very well having that printed PDF document before you leave. But some of that, of course, if it's a, you know, a, a three or four hour flight, that may not be relevant by the time you get there. Right. Yeah. And, and it's even worse than that, Matt. It may be that the, uh, what did you say, the A4 or the M4? A4. Yeah. yeah. The A4. It, it may be, the NOTAM may be that the the on-ramp from the B1195 onto the A4, A4. Yeah, yeah, at yeah. this is closed because of standing water. And as you're getting there, there are no barriers. There's nothing no. telling you that it's closed. Um, and you just take it because it looks clear to you and everybody else is taking it. But per the NOTAM, that on-ramp may be closed. So I mean, now you're liable for that. True, true, and of course, you know, I mean, I had, uh, I mean, I'd invested, I'd invested in a, a decent coach, large vehicle based sat nav that was very good about letting me know what roads were open and closed. That information was updated on the fly, but the advantage, <laughs> pardon the pun, uh, the advantage from my perspective was, of course, it was all done automatically. So if there was like the equivalent of a traffic traffic based NOTAM kick in in the middle of my route, the sat nav dealt with it for me. And so as long as I was following the sat nav, then then it made sure that I didn't, you know, sort of go to a a road or whatever that that, that wasn't um you know that wasn't open or, or something like that. I mean, surely it's not beyond the wit of of you know the tech gods out there to to develop something system some similar system for uh, John saying about your <laughs> next project, that'll be a hell no. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah so absolutely, Matt. Uh, there, there, there will be a better way. And um, with the with the technology, I mean, we put a man in, in space and then yeah. from a rocket that lands itself, surely there's a way to get information to the flight deck of an airplane. Absolutely. Um, one of the limitations in aviation is always you have to do things to the lowest common denominator, right? So somehow you have to be able to get no TAMs to the pilot that's flying a Piper Cub uh, yeah. from from you know Laney's Airport to Smithfield Airport, uh, and have that uh, pilot have access to the same 
technology and information <laughs> as a as a regional player. Uh, Stephen H is saying that apparently, uh, clearly, it's the airmen which are the weak link here. Just get rid of them. I mean, Goodbye. that's probably a bit extreme. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, there's. I don't know. Uh, it, it's a joke, <laughs> but some people are actually taking that seriously. <laughs> Take, oh wow. Okay, yeah, that's that's fine. It's uh, and I suppose obviously I, we're, we're out of time on this, but I suppose the other issue we have, of course, is the fact that not every aircraft is using the same standard technology. So the protocols involved that's in it. getting that data to the to the cockpit are all different you know the the access the data access that you have on a standard piper cub for example would be very different to what you've got on on the flight deck it's the same reason yeah. we're still using amplitude modulation radios on aircraft good you know? heavens like, good heavens anyway we're out of time uh, carlos we need to move on and the next one comes to us from uh, nist.gov uh, eureka alert.org uh -oh. <laughs> forward slash pub and tc.fa.gov as well. This my, one, my interest peaked when you said the word pub. I'm quite excited. Pub, by yeah, it. I know. Yeah. <laughs> this, uh, this is a good story. Um, having a father who's an ex-fire service uh, person, um, this is quite interesting. This uh, headline is new fire simulation tool could improve in-flight fire safety. So some of the most dangerous fires, as we all know, are the ones that you don't see coming. Now, that goes not only for fires in buildings, but for those kilometres off the ground aboard commercial airliners. Many aircraft have systems to detect fires early on, but fires that spark in their attics or overhead compartments or spaces with curved ceilings filled with air ducts, electrical wiring and structural elements could potentially sneak past them. Fire detector placement in overhead compartments is particularly challenging for fire protection engineers as it's unclear how to predict where smoke will travel amid the irregularly shaped clutter. A fire simulation computer model developed by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, could now offer some much-needed guidance thanks to re recent updates. Uh, in the past, Fire Dynamics Simulator, or FDS, launched in 2000, could model flat surfaces and block-like objects. Well, however, curved surfaces such as uneven terrain, outdoors or ceilings of trains and planes were less accurate. The update will allow FDS to understand smooth surfaces made of triangles, bringing its simulations closer to reality in certain cases. In a new study, a team of NIST and FAA researchers tested the tool against a real-world scenario where fires burned inside a grounded 747 SP. Oh no, there's hardly any of those left. With 50 temperature sensors inside. The team ran and compared both experiments and simulations, uh, finding a general agreement between the two. A layer of hot gas took shape near the ceiling in both scenarios with the same pockets of air uh, having formed between the metal ribs that line the ceiling and above gas burner. Uh, these results show the new FDS can even capture several traits of a real overhead compartment fire and suggest it could, with further development, become a reliable tool for fire protection engineers designing aircraft fire detection systems and suppression systems in the future. And it's quite a good tool. It's, obviously, this is a computer simulation program that obviously they're going to try and use to predict how fires will, um, you know, spark up in uh, in aircraft. But yeah, it's it's something we've we've come across and on the show in the past a few times where there's been fires in overhead um, bins, mainly caused by rogue um, battery charges and stuff. But <laughs> it's a good idea. What do you think, Nev? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great idea. And uh, it's one of the companies I used to work for. Oh, gosh, ten, over 10 years ago now, um, we had sort of software and simulation software that we worked with to deal with uh, these sorts of things, not specifically inside the aircraft like that, but outside uh, and also be, be able to simulate roads and, and this sort of set of stuff. But uh, this sort of technology is absolutely perfect with this kind of thing and trying to make sure that, um, you know, fire crews know, uh, and people know how to uh, tackle the fire should, should it break out in that area. Mm. It harks back to, remember that Nation Air um, flight many years ago, wasn't it? The DC-8 that had that fire got to within a few miles of the airport landing. I think Armando, you probably will remember that one. Um, got got literally a few miles from the air, airport, but then uh, sadly crashed. But um, that was an onboard fire. Uh, I forget what that was caused by, Armando. You remember? I don't. I don't remember. No. 
Yeah, and as uh, uh, John was just saying, the Swiss Air, that was the MD-11, I think it was MD-11, uh, the Swiss Air one that had the fire on board due to the um, the IFE wiring, uh, which was... I was going to say, if it was, a, if it was an very, MD-11 very or whatever, funny. that must have been quite old wiring, to be fair. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. The MD11, it, it uh, is a, an aging beast now, but uh, they're still being used though. They're still the MD11. Are they? Fine, but oh yeah, wow! Yeah, but Swiss Swiss got rid of theirs. I think they got rid of all theirs of quite a few years back. But, um, Nev, the next story, and we're back to having fights again. Oh. Ooh, what a treat! Two weeks on the trot, this has happened, doesn't it? This is on the DailyMail.co.uk website. Uh, and it says that uh, two American Airlines passengers got into a squabble that turned physical over who would deplane from their flight that oh. had just landed in Phoenix, Arizona. Clips show that the quick aftermath of the physical altercation that took place uh, as the plane sat in Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport after the brief flight from Los Angeles International Airport on Sunday. Multiple people who shared video videos noted that they almost missed their connecting flight whilst wake waiting for the commotion to settle. Profanity and other obscenities can be heard as one woman screams at another to get off the seat as people were falling over during the altercation. Exasperated passengers scream for the fighters to get off the plane as arguing continues up ahead. One woman on the plane shared that the flight fight was bet between two women on the flight who were trying to determine who was going to get off first. Well, American Airlines responded to one of the people who shared videos of the altercation, expressing happiness that the passengers were still able to make their connecting flights after the old ordeal. So they're chalking it up as a win. Um, the shocking altercation comes as the FAA announced last week that it was extending its unruly passenger zero tol tolerance policy uh, beyond the initial March the 30th date. The policy directs our safety inspectors and attorneys to take strong enforcement action against any passenger who disrupts or threatens the safety of a flight with penalties ranging from fines to a jail term, a March 16th press release from the FAA Administrator Steve Dixon reads. The number of cases that we're seeing is still far too high and it tells us urgent action continues to be required. You are not kidding, sir. <laughs> that's uh, wow. That's quite a quite a quite a moment, doesn't it? There are fights fighting, fighting nice, to get though. off, Nev. Yeah, you said well, they're fighting to see who get off first. I mean, I mean, I've been on a United flight, so I, I know how they feel. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> was it a, this was this was actually real live footage of Matt getting on this, uh, off this, of a seven fifty seven. Yeah, absolutely, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, absolutely. I was wrestling them to the ground to get off off mm. the aircraft. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Adams uh, has suggested uh, cattle pods prods may be required. He thinks he may have suggested that before. That's a good, uh, good I mean, point, actually. I mean, it's an excellent way of crowd control, I feel. I think yeah. I think that is yeah, the future. I think all crews yeah. should have tasers. <laughs> you well, do. after all, it is yeah. how many airlines get you on yeah. the airplane, so... Why not? Yeah, Why John, not John, to get you off the airplane. John in our ear has just got very excited about that prospect. I, I think for the airline <laughs> he worked for before, I think that would clearly be the future. Uh, but <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it's such a it's such a tinderbox every single time that people are getting on and off airplanes. I just don't understand. Like we're all going to the same place. Yeah. My goodness. Why just... are we in that much of a hurry? You know, <laughs> and, unless you're. Yeah. Un Unless you're me and you wait till the very last passenger gets off and then yeah, but that's because you want to. Go, I can say that's because you want to go and pester the poor pilot, pilot who's <laughs> just flown you there. He's probably exhausted and just wants to go to his crew hotel. So you, he you can remember go that, the, Nev? You remember that, Nev? <laughs> I do. Yes, I do very well indeed. I was just thinking though, you know, the last few BA flights I've been. This is BA, obviously, uh, but uh, I mean, actually, I'm sure all airlines are doing this. They're actually deboarding the aircraft one row at a time. Yeah. Uh, like the first you know eight rows or the first five rows whatever uh, and then beyond from there but this just seems to be a bit of a free-for-all going on there yeah. isn't there? and uh, it, it doesn't take very much for this sort of thing to kick off 
Um, Different rules, isn't it? I would also question <laughs> some of the fashion sense that I saw in those clips. Wow, well. okay, gosh. Really about that. No. <laughs> I mean, they weren't all wearing crisp shirts. That That is a, a given, which is outrageous, Neff, let's be honest. Um, actually, I should just say, uh, I, I, my background keeps changing. Sorry about that. I, I, I have changed it. Uh, but uh, thank you very much to... The one I've chosen, actually, is Stefan Krauss. So thank you very much for sending that to, uh, to me. Apparently, it's a uh, an A380 Singapore Airlines from the other day so look they are still in the air the the uh, the a380s which is very exciting I, i've had some pictures from loads of people uh nick codling just to name one so i look very open up a big can of worms now mate. oh have i oh dear why pictures coming in everywhere now You'll have oh, well it, absolutely multiple. no no, no. I, I got, i'm gonna try somebody remind me to chat because i've got loads now thank you and there, there's a great one of uh from kemble which uh which nick has, mm. has, has um sent which I, I i want to use next week so there we are so thank you very much stefan thank you Armando, moving on to you with, uh, this is a good one, I like this one. Yeah, speaking of cabin crew with uh, cattle prods, uh, so <laughs> if you want more information wow. on this story, you can go to One Mile at a Time or Live and Let's Fly. Uh, United Airlines will share passenger feedback directly with flight attendants. Oh, dear. <laughs> so in a move to, uh, that aims to increase transparency and encourage flight attendants to provide excellent service with those cattle prods, United <laughs> Airlines will start sharing post-flight passenger feedback directly with those flight attendants from that flight. This is to partly address the feeling amongst many flight attendants that they don't feel like the, uh, they feel like the only time that they hear from their supervisors is when they've done something wrong. Uh, starting April 1st, United will share customer feedback on select routes with flight attendants based in Chicago and Honolulu. Uh, a flight attendant memo seen by the media said, by sharing this flight-specific feedback with each onboard crew, you'll be able to see the impact you've made on each customer's experience and will be able to better recognize you for it. United stressed uh, flight attendants that the uh, two flight attendants that the new more direct feedback is not meant to be punitive in the coming months passengers will also be able to complete surveys about the in-flight uh, experience on both the united app and seatback ife screens uh, it's claimed that in 2020 united flight attendants received over 20,000 compliments and that compliments exceeded complaints at a 20 to 1 ratio meaning United received only 1,000 complaints about flight attendants in 2020, or around three per day. The Association of Flight Attendants, or the AFA, which is a union representing United flight attendants, has now chimed in on this new program. They say, while this new program is geared to focus on constructive or positive feedback, we all understand that this also offers an opportunity for less positive responses as well. We've all been in situations where we get frustrated as you saw in that previous story, and after some time and perspective, feel differently. The instant gratification of this concept could lead to potentially negative reports and uh, a lack of objectivity. The union is reminding flight attendants to file incident reports on the spot when things go wrong so that flight attendants can share their perspectives. Um, now, for me, I think this is a great move. Uh, I am not a flight attendant, so I am not a customer-facing uh, airline employee, uh, at least not day to day. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting that this is just now happening when, when for so many years and in, in technology has made it where people can leave, uh, feedback. Um, I am one of those people that leaves positive feedback. I, I generally, if I have an issue now, this is coming from somebody in the industry, but if I have an issue with something specifically, I will usually address it directly with that with that cabin crew or that or that pilot on the spot. Um, I don't feel the need to to go on Twitter and, and you know, um, diss a crew. Um, now, the flip side of that is whenever there's great service or a great product. So for example, the new um, CRJ 550, right? I thought it was a, a, a great um, aircraft. I enjoyed flying on it. It was, uh, it looked beautiful and it was roomy and, and I actually left a, uh, a positive feedback on social media for that airline. Um, so, uh, yeah, what are you going to do? You know, I, I, I like it. Um, I see I see the AFA point of view where, um, you know, it's kind of like one of those Google reviews on on a restaurant. You once a once a bad review is on there, it's kind of hard to to get it off the Internet. So. I mean, know, what I, do you guys think? I mean, we've got uh, I mean, the, the company that I now work for, it. 
your performance is very much marked on the feedback that you receive directly from the customers. So uh, every time you've been in contact with a customer, whether it be on the phone or by email, um, when you've completed that call, when you've closed the call or the email, they're sent a little feedback form to say, you know, how was your experience today? And I must admit, it was something that I was very nervous about. But actually, if you've done your job properly, you've genuinely got no reason to be concerned and I've I've had very difficult delivery based issues slash concerns if you like where a customer has you know that it says it's been delivered but it hasn't been but in that negative situation it's all about how you deal with the problem there and then and I do feel that's very relevant as far as cabin crew are concerned as well it's like you know things will go wrong in flight but it's all about how you deal with that situation there and then now of course you know perhaps unlike cabin crew my hands are less tied so there are lots of things that i can do to try and make that customer feel sort of happy about you know the situation that they find themselves in and i do feel perhaps you know certainly as far as cabin crew is concerned i don't know so much about pilots because you know they do tend to be uh, whilst there is obviously i assume there's sort of like a company line um you know the pilot is however in a position perhaps to to make more decisions themselves rather than having to to follow company policy perhaps but, oh the uh, things you don't know no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> indeed but uh, you know but, I'll, but I'll I, the, the... I i feel for cabin crew because i'm sure there are lots of things that if they were able to be themselves where they would perhaps handle a situation slightly different i don't know i mean you know i need to talk to to, to cabin crew directly about you know what things they can do but you know th there are things you in, in my line of work there are things you can do to turn a negative negative situation into a situation where actually they're quite pleased with the way it was held so this bad thing happened you sorted it out for them happy days well, let's take the last story as an example so the two ladies that got into that brawl are higher high highly likely to leave a negative review yeah. for that cabin crew right so it is incumbent upon the people that were around uh, also mm. on that airplane to, to take the time them. to say yeah. hey no they actually did a great job these two individuals were just way off the reservation and the cabin crew did a great job but if the other folks around don't take the time to do, leave that positive feedback that particular incident could reflect negatively on those flight attendants and that and that entire crew so it only works if everybody uses it yeah yeah no i mean that 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 is that is fair comment i don't know uh I, I don't know if we're lucky enough to have lots of cabin crew in the the chat room, but I would love to hear your feedback. Um, we've got to move on, unfortunately. But you know, if you do feel strongly about it, please do get in touch. Plus four four seven five seven two two four nine one six six. I'm sure it's a subject that we'll come back to, and we'll keep them on file. Podcast at plaintalkinguk dot com is the email address. Um, we better move on. Uh, who's in charge next? So this one comes to us from Sky, uh, SkyTracksRatings.com. And for anyone who's flown Japan Airlines, I haven't yet. I do intend on, though, because I get so many good reviews. But uh, Japan Airlines has been certified with a five-star Skytrax COVID-19 airline safety rating. So this week they've been certified with the highest level five-star rating uh, for uh, airline safety, becoming one of the few airlines worldwide to achieve this recognition for COVID-19 safety standards. Japan Airlines has introduced a well-measured portfolio of safety uh, practices to reduce the risks related to the spread of COVID-19. And this includes elements of enhanced physical distancing, hand hygiene, and increased disinfection and cleaning protocols in the airport and on board flights. As part of the Fly Safe commitment, Japan Airlines has expedited the rollout of touchless technologies for domestic check-in and bag drop, recently launched a robot customer service assistant to help customers with flight information. Premium passengers will find uh, new low contact procedures in the first class lounge as jail has launched electronic a la carte dining ordering and table service and shower booking system uh, the airline also provides guests with a novel antiviral wallet for storing face masks while on uh, board and dining and uh, mr yuji 
Osaka, president and CEO of Japan Airlines, said since the early stages of COVID-19 pandemic, the JAL group has taken proactive steps to implement and strengthen key measures against COVID-19 and produce customers a safe and secure travel experience. Through the efforts of our dedicated staff at the JAL Group, it's certainly an honour to be certified and receive the highest five-star COVID-19 uh, rating uh, by Skytrax. Uh, the JAL Group will continue to strengthen our COVID-19 measures and look forward to the day when people around the world can travel safely. JAL joins ANA, Oman Air, Qatar Airways and Air Baltic in the Skytrax five-star COVID safety airline group. So just for your information, just a quick one, the five star rating means it's doing pretty much everything right. To achieve the five star rating, staff, uh, service and product standards must be either meeting, uh, meeting global um, standards uh, for the item under valuation. The product analysis, is uh, uh, this is a clear tangible item. And for service assessment, we look at all aspects of excellent service support by true consistency. Um, well, it's safe to say, I'm not surprised. I mean, Nev, BA has a 4 million star rating, according to this uh, <laughs> on the Does uh, it? show notes. Um, <laughs> and someone's put on here something else about some other airlines that uh, may have a slightly lower rating. Some wag has interfered with the show notes. There. <gasps> How rude. Uh, John will be, well, yes, they, John will uh, be furious. Are you BA aware of that? does <laughs> have a four-star rating, uh, as does Ryanair, EastJet and Vueling, and a whole, hope of, a whole heap of others as well. So, How do you uh, feel, but, genuinely, so, how do you feel about that, though, Nev? I mean, you know, bearing in mind, and I'm using Ryanair as an example because that's the one that we, we poke the most fun at, you know, and it's got a four-star rating. I mean, how do you feel uh, about BA being sort of lumped into that same bracket? Well, it, it's a it's a different model, isn't it? Let's face it. You know, you've got Ryanair doing low cost flights within Europe. Mm. BA do a little bit of that as well, but most of its revenue, of course, comes from the long haul uh, business class sector, and there's been none of that going on, or very little of it going on, in the last twelve months. So, um, yeah, I think it's very difficult to compare the two things. Uh, I mean, they're very different models, different, aren't they? D different models, exactly right. Yes. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So. Now, Matt, you've got the, uh, the next story, and I must say, when I found this one, I was only a um, day before yesterday, I think <laughs> I found this story. This amused me, especially with the figures. Right, okay, yes. Uh, w when you say stuff like that, I do get quite nervous, I'll be honest. We've got a picture that we'll share with you on this story very shortly. Anyway, uh, it's businesstraveller.com is the website, and the headline is ANA sells $1.8 million dollars of worth in home delivered airline meals. One point, let's just say that number again out loud. $1.8 million worth of home delivered airline meals. Al Nippon Airways sold over 260,000 in flight meals to travel starved consumers in the three months leading up to March 12th. Uh, launched in December by Japan's largest airline, its Sky Kitchen delivery service provides domestic residents with a selection of international uh, economy class meals. Uh, ANA's offering, which has generated revenue of $1.8 million uh, to the airline, has proved so popular that meals sell out within meals. Minutes. Each time we place the meals on our online market, uh, they sell out within 45 minutes on average. Uh, some items were gone in five minutes, such as beef, uh, oh, I'm going to say, I want, uh, uh, sukiyaki, and uh, hamburger steak uh, demi glaze with uh, sauce uh, with buttered rice and creamy scrambled eggs. And a that sounds really nice. An ANA spokesman told Forbes uh, prior to them to the, pa the pandemic, uh, ANA's catering department. Uh, uh, catering arm produced as many as 30,000 meals per day. The airline's output has since fallen to around about 90, uh, fallen by around 90%. Uh, we hope customers missing their experience of flying can enjoy our in flight meals at home and we will continue selling to meet their ongoing demand. We hope that after the situation is resolved, they will choose to fly with us because of our high quality in flight meals, uh, the airline added in a statement. 
treatment to business traveler now actually i've got a question i say i haven't been lucky enough to do <laughs> much business class to flying but just out of interest i mean have any of you ever made a decision on the airline that you're going to fly with purely based on the in-flight meal experience it's uh, it, well, I mean, because most of us are in economy, so perhaps we should, uh, uh, you know, sort of paint that brush there. I mean, Carlos, have you ever made a decision of, of what meal, you know, what airline you're going to fly with based on the uh, the online meal experience? Only only once, and that was when we travelled to Oman, and we we were um, we were going to fly it with Oman Air because they mm. flew direct. Um, right. But, but in the end, I changed uh, changed our mind. We went, we flew with Emirates because we've flown with Emirates a number of times before. And their food is just, even in uh, um, economy, the food on Emirates is very, very good. And Oman Air is... Um, Cheaper? It's not quite as nice. Right, <laughs> okay. Way. Have you flown with Oman Air? So you, you've got a... Mm, so yeah, you have yeah. got a direct comparison. Oh, yeah. Uh, right, yeah. okay. But the two products are okay. very, very, very different considering they're both uh, a Middle East Airlines. I mean, I'll throw this to Ev- Nev, but I think uh, I think I already know the answer to this. Sorry, what's economy? Fair enough. Yeah. Moving on, I, and I, I, <laughs> I jest, of course. Um, well, th- of course, uh, BA are trying this out as well. Actually, they're doing, uh, they're selling their first class meals delivered to your door as well. I've just oh, put wow. that in the uh, our chat room for listeners to uh, have a look at. Uh, but it's an interesting concept. But I had no idea that this was so popular. I mean, th- they are selling these things by the bucket load aren't they yeah uh, uh, yeah it's an interesting angle on something and the marketing and catering folks have come up with a a great idea i I mean does it come with the special oven required in order to warm them up or have you got to (laughs) stick them in the microwave because it's Uh, special gloves as well well quite don't don't you think though guys this is an awesome idea airlines are losing money Mm. every by by the you know millions by the day yeah this is a great idea i think to uh to to produce some revenue you know um, I mean, Mars High is saying actually that they've never had a bad airline meal. That's interesting. Armando, I haven't asked you this particular question. Have you ever? Um, is it okay? Appar- apparently, he he's, he's on mute. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. We'll scrap that and move on then. Uh, it was. Uh, I, I was just intrigued today because obviously Armando's done a lot more flying. Perhaps I mean Nev's probably done the most flying out of all of us, but it's been mainly focused with one specific airline. Um, that's where Armando made. I'll, I'll have to say, Nev, that honestly, that that one we had coming back from Dubai it just knocks it out of the park it was, every time. Every, what did we have? Was it uh, was it steak? steak or was yeah, it the, fillet steak. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, Richard is suggesting that maybe the reclaimers should jack up their prices for the old meal trolleys now, based on this conversation. <laughs> uh, I think they may well do. Um, but uh, yeah, there we go. Oh, I'm really gutted Armando wasn't there. That's a shame. Anyway, uh, so uh, the Nev. next story. Now this is uh, well a bad news story, but it turned out very good. So that's that's good to hear. And uh, this was uh, on one of the LinkedIn pages and the uh, Carly, uh, College Times as well. Uh, it says that passengers on a Chennai-bound Emirates flight hailed the swift action taken by the crew, who saved the life of a passenger who fell sick during the four-hour flight. Confirming the news, an Emirates spokesman. Uh, told the newspaper that uh, Emirates can confirm that on flight EK544 on March the 19th of this year, a passenger felt unwell and our cabin crew members immediately administered medical assistance to the passenger following standard protocol. The passenger recovered and disembarked the aircraft upon arrival at Chennai. Uh, The spokesman added all Emirates cabin crew go through a comprehensive training program that prepares them to recognise and deal with medical events during the flight. The health and safety of our customers and our crew are of the utmost importance to us. uh, Taking to social media, one of the passengers on the Dubai to Chennai uh, flight who witnessed the incident posted the pictures of two PPE clad members of the cabin crew of the flight calling them unnamed heroes. Uh, Narrating the incident, the passenger wrote, today as I travelled to Chennai uh, with a heavy heart having lost my father to Covid I was so heartened to witness the flight crew saving the life of a passenger who fell unconscious mid-flight and stopped breathing. They were remarkable, keeping their calm, moved swiftly, had a clear chain of command and with four crew members following a step-by-step protocol provided oxygen support 
performed CPR procedures mid-flight and sent a family safe uh, without losing a life. Thanking the cabin crew of the airline, he wrote, Here it is for the unnamed heroes, unassuming and two of the humble cabin crew members from the team of four. Thank you for saving a life. And I think that's a really, really nice story. And of course, you've got to remember that all cabin crew are trained to very high standards in first aid and also looking out for these sorts of problems. And they are very capable people. They're not just there to serve no. you tea and coffee and, and the nice meals very that true. we spoke about. They do a fantastic mm. job for the safety of the passengers. And this is a great example of it. It is absolutely. I mean, they're very much the unsung heroes and they get a rough time, are they? But they are the people that, that we are going to rely on in the event of an emergency. And I, I do wonder if a lot of these Muppets, frankly, who are arguing, brawling and all that kind of thing with the cabin crew, they're very much underrated. I, I will always uh, say that. Uh, I do feel they're very much underrated as, as part of, uh, you know, it's the, uh, the yeah, they are so important. So that is where we bring the commercial news segment uh, to a close this week. And on to the next part of the show, which is uh, the awesome segment from The Plain Truths. And it's one that we all look forward to every week. And uh, for those people who travel regularly on aircraft, not so much now at the moment, but for those people who always take notice of the crew at the beginning of a flight when they're telling you what goes on in the event of an evacuation, this one is all about evacuation procedures. Hello and welcome to Another Plain Truce and this week we're going to be talking about emergency evacuations. Joining me as always is the legend that is Captain Al. Hi Captain Al. Hi Matt. Look, we have a question from one of our marvellous viewers. Uh, so this came in via the YouTube channel, and I apologise if I get this wrong. It came in from Sir Hingle McCringleberry. They said, uh, hi, could you ask Captain Al about emergency evacuation procedures? Uh, what is a water landing slash belly landing and what authorities are involved? Also, uh, what are the airline's duties uh, in getting passengers home safely? Fantastic question, sir. So let's break these down into individual bits. So for an emergency evacuation, there are basically two elements to this as to whether it was predetermined or, uh, or whether it was unpredetermined. So obviously, if it's an event that's taking place that you know that you're going to have to do an emergency evacuation, so that might be uh, a landing on water or a belly landing. So let's have a quick sort of tangential chat about those. So uh, a landing on water, they don't happen very often. Obviously, we've got the famous miracle on the Hudson. Um, and a belly landing is where the undercarriage is un unavailable. So for any reason, you can't get the uh, undercarriage down, then you're going to have to land the aircraft on its belly. Now, in the case of uh, a belly landing, obviously, you're going to have some pre-indication that the undercarriage isn't working so you put the gear down and you don't get three greens you'll go through a checklist recycle the gear do a bit of fault finding and if eventually you conclude that you uh, don't have a landing gear to use then you have time to plan your course of action there is a checklist for landing with unsafe gear you'd have time to advise the cabin crew and they would then have time to brief the passengers for an emergency evacuation uh, people would you know, remove high heels in preparation, that sort of thing. If, however, it's something a bit like uh, Miracle on the Hudson, where there was no time to pre-brief the passengers, it's happening as you see it, as you do it, um, then again, there is a, a, a checklist for ditching on water, uh, which was partially completed by the guys uh, on Miracle on the Hudson, I say partially completed, that's no criticism. They did what they could in the time that they have. And of course, checklists are there as a manufacturer's guideline, a recommendation as the operating crew on the day, you have to do what is necessary. So one of the things that we do in the simulator quite often is an emergency evacuation. And it's usually done as part of a engine fire on takeoff scenario. So if you imagine 
uh, you're just doing a normal takeoff, you trundle down the runway shortly before V1, which is your go or stop decision speed, you have an engine fire, you bring the aircraft to halt, you go through the initial items which are trying to extinguish the fire, it becomes apparent that the fire has not gone out. At that point, you basically stop doing what you're doing and you make a irreversible decision. Are we going to evacuate or not? So if the fire is still burning or you have indications that that's the case, then the chances are that you're going to evacuate. And once you start that process, you cannot stop it. You can't say to hundreds of people, stop, stop, it's okay, it's fine, stay on the burning aeroplane, everything's under control. <laughs> so there is quite a significant decision point there. So uh, evacuations uh, aren't rushed into because you can guarantee that as soon as you have people jumping down those slides, you are going to have injuries. There will be minor injuries, so broken limbs, you know, sprained ankles, that sort of thing, but you will have injuries. Now, under those sort of circumstances, once the evacuation takes place, pretty much as a captain, you're going to ensure that you're the last person off the aircraft. And indeed, uh, the mighty Captain Sullenberger did indeed that. He walked down the entire length of the aircraft and made sure that everybody was off. I mean, he was up to his ankles, I think, in water towards the back of the aeroplane, but he made sure, certain that everybody was off. Uh, and then you leave the aircraft yourself. And that's pretty much where your responsibilities end because now the whole scene is handed over to the emergency services. So if it's happened at an airport, then you're in the hands of, they will have various titles, but the accident coordinator, the fire chief, et cetera, et cetera. And they are responsible for coordinating everything. Uh, if it's a well organized evacuation, then the passengers will be at the two sides of the aircraft, uh, head counts will be done. Uh, but as you can imagine, once people have got off an aircraft under these sorts of circumstances, it's kind of chaos and we've seen lots of videos of people just wandering around you know with phones in hand taking videos selfies discussing who's got the best carry-on luggage that they've managed to get <laughs> off the aircraft as an aside if you are ever a passenger on an aeroplane and you have to evacuate do not take your luggage with you it won't help you and it will be of no use and you may find yourself being prosecuted for it just get yourself and everybody else off. You can go back for the luggage later. The chances are it will be perfectly intact. Um, so yeah, big deal of evacuations, um, not to be taken lightly. Um, we've covered belly landings. So there was quite a famous incident. I think it was a Boeing 767 from Lot Polish Airlines a couple of, well, a number of years ago now, where they tried and tried and tried to lower the undercarriage, but it wasn't having any of it. So they had to land um, on a prepared runway and then evacuate the airplane. Now, there's not an awful lot that you can do uh, under those circumstances. Uh, you just try to make the touchdown as smooth as possible. Ideally find somewhere that's quite long because it's gonna take uh, a little bit of wear and tear on the airplane, a little bit of wear and tear um, on the runway. But in that particular case, uh, there were no significant injuries, if I remember rightly. Uh, water landings, well, we've seen the demonstration of that. Uh, they can be carried out. But to be perfectly honest, uh, smooth water helps. Uh, if you're going to plan to ditch an aeroplane in the Atlantic this time of year, um, it's going to take quite a while for the rescue ships to come out to you. So not, not the nicest scenario to have. And with regards to the responsibility for the passengers after an evacuation, um, that's a, an interesting one because passengers will have gone in various directions. Usually the airport will take responsibility for the passengers or if it took place away from an airport, then the authorities will because the crew will be kind of taken away for investigation. There'll be the usual mandatory drug and alcohol testing, all the sorts of things that you might expect to take place after an accident. Um, and therefore, not really going to be in a position to uh, look after the passengers as, as a crew. With regards to the airline, yes, of course, they will do everything that they can. 
in collaboration with uh, the airport, uh, the police, security services, etc. Um, so it's a it's a multi agency affair is probably the best way of answering that. Wow. Well, comprehensively answered as always. I hope that's uh, everything you wanted to hear, Sir Hingle McCringleberry. Uh, thanks for your question. If you'd like to be able to do the same, uh, get in touch by contacting us on podcast at plaintalkinguk.com. That's podcast at plaintalkinguk.com. And Captain Al may well be asking your very own question very soon. Thanks, Captain Al. It's a pleasure. Well, uh, welcome to our London studios. Uh, welcome to the A320 Lounge uh, webinar uh, tech presentation, um, obviously for the 320 series. Welcome to the A320 and 737 Lounge, bringing technical refresher courses directly to you. Using our cutting edge broadcasting facilities, enjoy a fully interactive technical refresher course from the comfort of your own home. All of our webinars are live and you can ask your instructor a question at any point during the day. All of our instructors are highly experienced and can help you. No more expensive nights away from home, no new software required, just an internet connection. Courses are run at regular intervals, so check out A320 Lounge and 737lounge.com for more details. Wow. Well done on that uh, segment, Al and uh, Matt, of course. Thank you for that. And I know you've got uh, quite a few more in the uh, in the ba in the bag, I should say, ready, haven't you, for uh, future shows? I'm going to say yes. I'm not sure. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> but on that note, actually, if anyone watching or listening to the show as an audio podcast, if you have any ideas about uh, something you want to know that you can ask Matt and Captain Al to uh, talk about on The Plain Truths, do get in touch with the show uh, All the social media content and links will be at the end of this show. So, moving on, we're going to hand things over to uh, Armando then. Oh, this is going to be a good one. If you guys are willing to bear with me, Matt, hit the button. All the folks coming over from Air Show World, thank you for joining us. You're just in time for the best part of the show. This uh, <laughs> Rude. this uh, this this first <laughs> chunk of military is actually not so great. It's just a bunch of airplanes falling out of the sky. Um, so the first story comes to us from the BBC. Two pilots ejected from an aircraft from the 736 Naval Air Squadron based at uh, Royal Naval Air Station Caldros, uh, according to the Ministry of Defense. The pilots were checked by critical care paramedics at the scene, according to the Cornwall Air Ambulance. They were then airlifted to a hospital. Defense Minister Johnny Mercer said that the crash was due to a suspected engine failure. There's been nothing more to it than that, he said. Uh, they've had a problem. They've ejected. They've been picked up. We're assessing them and we'll have more information in due course. Police said they received reports of the two-seater training aircraft crashing at the St. Martin area on the Lizard Peninsula and have asked people to stay away. Eyewitness David Hoskin, a, for, a farmer, said he heard an unbelievable bang and saw two people ejecting from the airplane. He found the two men in fairly good spirits and chatting near, uh, near the crash scene. One had cuts and bruises on his face from landing in the trees next to the field. Uh, the pilot was very concerned about the whereabouts of the jet, he said. They said they aimed to put it in the Halford River, uh, but then they saw it heading away from the river. The plane actually uh, crashed into a small woodland at the bottom of a field. The police have allowed reporters to win at about uh, 50 meters of the debris, but the only evidence of the crash uh, from there is just a hole in a hedge and a, uh, the strong smell of fuel in the air. Um, the fire service dammed a river that runs through the woodland to reduce the risk of fuel contamination into the water. Another eyewitness, Richard Cooper, said that there is no plane in view. It's gone through a load of trees and down into a valley in a wooded area. There's a handful of broken branches. It seems like a little chaotic down there at the moment, but they seem to have it all under control. Um, there was a couple, uh, numerous eyewitnesses uh, to this to this crash, and, and by all uh, by all accounts, the, the pilots are safe. There was a, a bit of an update um, in that the pilots were actually safe, and the Ministry of Defense 
uh, have uh, now paused all uh, Hawk T1. I don't think we mentioned that um, aircraft operations as a precautionary measure. Um, so the T1 is a two-seater training aircraft that's used uh, by the Royal Navy uh, to simulate ship attacks. They um, they use it pretty much for you know as as the backbone of their training there. Now, in a related story, um, in Taipei, two Taiwanese fighter jets crashed on Monday in the third such incident in the past six months, when uh, at a time when Beijing claimed islands. Uh, Beijing claimed islands armed force are under increasing pressure to intercept Chinese aircraft on an almost daily basis. So while Taiwan's air force is well-trained and well-equipped, mostly with US made equipment, it is dwarfed by China's. Uh, Beijing views the democratic island as its own territory and has never renounced the use of force to bring it under Chinese control. So Taiwan's National Rescue Command Center said that two Air Force F-5E fighters, each with one pilot aboard, crashed into the sea off the island's southern coast, uh, or southeast coast, after they apparently collided in midair during a training mission. An Air Force helicopter, Coast Guard, and other rescue ships have been scrambled to look for the pilots. Uh, Taiwan's Ministry of Defense said it is working on a statement um, and provided no other immediate comment. Uh, according to uh, the official news, uh, central news agency, they said that the Air Force had now grounded the entire F-5 fleet that operates from that particular air base. Um, the U.S. Uh, builds the F-5 fighters, first entered service in Taiwan in the late 1970s. Most have been retired from frontline activities, though some are still used for training and as backups for the main fleet. Now, in last October, another F-5 crashed, killing the pilot. Uh, the, uh, the following month, a much more modern F-16 crashed off Taiwan's east coast. Uh, that pilot also died. Um, and then I saw an update a little bit later, uh, a couple days later, that the uh, Taiwanese Air Force has uh, reportedly grounded its entire F-5 fleet uh, following that mid-air collision. Um, the, uh, one of the pilots was confirmed um, uh, dead, while the other pilot is actually still missing, according to um, several media sources. Um, continuing on with this trend and, and even more bad news, the uh, three crew members were killed in an accident uh, involving a Russian uh, aerospace force Tu-22 backfire bomber at uh, Shaiko Shaikovka Air Base in Kaluga region. That's in Western Russia. Uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense confirmed that the crew lost their lives due to an abnormal operation of the ejection seats. Uh, Russia's state-run media outlet um, RIA Novosti said that the incident occurred while the Tu-22 was being prepared for a training, right, uh, training flight at uh, Shaikovka, while its counterpart uh, specified that uh, the ejections were initiated when the bomber's two engines were started on the ground. It remains unclear whether the seats were activated deliberately or whether the ejection sequence was unintentional. A fourth crew member reportedly survived the incident and was taken to a medical facility, but it's not known whether they ejected or remained aboard the aircraft. So this was a ground mishap where, um, you know, I, I think most uh, ejection seats are, are supposed to be zero, zero. So, so zero forward airspeed at zero altitude. Um, so we'll, we'll probably find out, uh, I don't know, in, in due course what, what happened here, but uh, the T-22 has a crew of four on board with, with uh, ejection seats, as, as you can tell from the story. But um, uh, there was a different news article that said that uh, the particular ejection seat used in this aircraft requires a minimum speed of 80 miles per hour um, for altitudes below 200 feet. So would the, the crew would have known that. So if they intentionally punched from this aircraft, then uh, either it was a malfunction or they uh, saw that as their best option um, at that time. So, yeah, not a not a good week in in military aviation, at least. No, plenty going on on Monday. Plenty to keep you amused, anyway, with the uh, stories this week. But uh, moving on to the next story, this is we're going to uh, the aviationist.com for this one. And we're moving on to the F-35B, which was damaged when ammunition round exploded as it left the GAU-22 gun pod under the fuselage. So the F-35B was damaged by the explosion of the ammunition round, leaving the aircraft's GAU-22 gun pod 
during a nighttime mission out of Marine Corps Air Station Yuma, Arizona. I got that right, Armando. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's correct. Yuma. An F 35B with uh, uh, VMX, which is, refresh my memory. VMX What's that? VMX 1. Pre uh, no, the abbreviation VMX. Oh, you know what? That's a that's a Navy and Marine Corps speak. I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> ah, the US, right. US Marine Corps. So the US Marine it's Corps. It's the squadron is, number. It's a, it's it's the uh, whatever their their. Um, oh, geez, I never understood the Navy abbreviations. This is but, why I find it yeah. difficult. So the US Marine Corps. <laughs> <laughs> li Valley li one. You can listen to uh, listen very quietly under the bottom there of uh, you know <laughs> with uh, with the. Uh, um, uh, Nev chipping in there, yeah, yeah. It's uh, you, you. You're so good at this segment, Nev. I, I don't know what you make all the fuss about. He is good. <laughs> so, U.S. Marine Corps Test and Evaluation Squadron, based at uh, Marine Air Corps Station, Yuma, Arizona, was damaged during a night CAS or close air support mission on March the twelfth, uh, according to Military.com. Oriana Plawak who was the first to report about the mishap. The F-35B was operating over the Yuma Air uh, Yuma Range Complex when a PGU-32U uh, semi-armor-piercing high-explosive incendiary tracer 25mm uh, round exploded after leaving the fighter's GA-22 gun pod. The aircraft landed safely and the mishap did not result in any injuries to personnel. However, it was given the most severe classification, a Class A, which means a damage of at least 2.5 metres or uh, US million, sorry, 2.5 million US dollars. Thank you, John. Or the loss of the airframe. A investigation is ongoing at present. You can see it's my chosen subject as well. I'll do well on Mastermind. It's not <laughs> even clear whether the round was fired deliberately. Um, the F-35B's General Dynamics GAU-22 uh, GAU uh, 25mm round uses a unique four-barrel configuration that was developed from the highly successful five-barreled uh, 25mm GAU-12 gun also built by General Dynamics. As often highlighted, although the GAU-22 gun pod was designed with low observability, uh, observability characteristics the external pod unit degrades and the f-35b's radar cross-section making the fifth generation aircraft more visible to radars not a good idea still this acceptable is acceptable they said here as it's uh, for the non-stealthy av8 harrier jets they will replace shouldn't replace them they're worth the money in gold for the scenarios where the u.s marine corps f-35b jets are carry a uh, to I can all carry a out CAS missions in pers per permissive airspace. My word, Jesus is a story and a half. But anyway, uh, not something you hear about often um, on the uh, news feeds. But uh, is this a regular occurrence, Amanda, for uh, devices to um, go off? Yeah, you know, Un for uncommanded for, for around to. I mean, it's it's. Uh, Whenever you get to do a live fire mission, it's always interesting and it's always fun. Um, and you certainly don't expect things to go boom right either outside the airplane. Um, I, uh, I have a friend actually who was who was telling us just a story just the other day about uh, the first some of the first rockets they were testing on the UH sixties uh, rocket pods, and uh, quite a few of them went boom right in front of the airplane and caused a little bit of damage, which seems to be what happens uh, with this uh, particular. Um, that wasn't a gun malfunction. It was a round malfunction, and it and it appears to have just exploded. Um, but to but to cause two point five million dollars worth of damage, um, yeah, that's an emotional event for the pilot, probably thinking he's getting shot down by his own airplane <laughs> at that moment. Uh, now, um, uh, actually, yet, going going back to what we were talking about a moment ago, by the way, I don't know if John can pop that back up now. Uh, we have an answer to what what the the VMX stood for, by the way, uh, oh, which I think la uh, Lane. That's why we have a Lane of all people. Lane. Uh, yeah, like no jokes here. Actual serious stuff coming in. Who'd have wow. thought it? Uh, so there you go, Armando, if you'd like to read that out. There you go. So the V is for fixed wing, the uh, M is for marine, and the X is for test and evaluation. And that uh, is what 
the uh, acronym is. Wow. There you go. You see, so it's a tested evaluation site. Well, I'm not worthy. worthy. Okay, now somebody's need... pretty quick with the Googles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to correct this now, Lane. We need a joke like within the next five minutes, all oh, right? Because that was all yeah. a bit too. That was all a bit too serious. Too serious for yeah. Lane. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I spent a, I spent a lot of time in the military in the Air Force, and I still never understood <laughs> the Navy. I've said that plenty of times on this show. Sometimes when I pick my own Navy stories, I'm like, oh, geez, I don't know what they're talking about. There's so many acronyms. <laughs> You know, um, I will I will go back and make a slight correction on on the first story, um, which I think Captain Cruz uh, pointed out. There is no official Taiwanese Air Force. It's actually the Republic of China Air Force. Okay. Um, so sometimes when when we get some of these articles, um, you know, we're just taking them from the source. Mm. And uh, but it, it sometimes you, you can't validate those sources or they may be politically leaned one way or another. So I will make sure that from uh, from now on every time we refer to that will because that's the second time i've done it i think that's the second time he's called me out on it right so, <laughs> so from now on it is the republic of china i know but this is why our chat room is awesome you see that's why you know it's why, why we strive for a higher than 50 percent accuracy than some other podcasts that's what <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Pop, John's panicking pop, now. Pop, We're being told pop, to move on before we get sued. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, who's got the final story then? I'll take the final one, shall I? It's, oh, uh, correct on answer. <laughs> lightglobal.com. And it says that Marshall expects strong demand for surplus UK Hercules. Well, set to be retired from the RAF uh, use in 2023, the service's Lockheed Martin C-130J-30 tactical transports will represent an attractive proposition for second-hand buyers, according to support provider Marshall Aerospace and Defence Group. Uh, the UK's MOD on the 22nd of March announced its intention to withdraw the RAF's remaining 14 C-130Js uh, from from use more than a decade earlier than previously planned. We had been anticipated that the MOD would bring forward the out-of-service date for the C-130 fleet. Uh, we had not expected such a short time frame, said uh, Marshall Aerospace and Defence Group's uh, Chief Executive Gary Moynihan. Uh, describing the decision as disappointing news for Marshall, he says, in line with the Prime Minister's commitment in the 16th of March integrated review to prioritising UK industrial capability, we expect to support the RAF in the successful resale of the C-130 fleet in order to maximise return for the UK economy and in turn reduce the risk of significant job losses. Moynihan says that the company will work in partnership with the MOD to manage the withdrawal as effectively as possible given the timescales. Well, introduced in 1999, the tactical transports have been worked hard through uh, their operational lives, including while supporting Supporting UK military activities in Afghanistan and Iraq. The UK originally acquired 25 aircraft but has, has previously withdrawn its short fuselage examples from service, selling two each to the air forces of Bahrain and Bangladesh and a single example to the US, uh, US Navy. Uh, Marshall's prepared all of these airframes at its Cambridge airport site prior to delivery to their new owners. We remain confident that our C-130 MRO business can continue to grow, Moynihan says. We have 17 long-term international customers and are continuing to win more contracts with overseas operators who recognise the unique capability of the platform. Its recent successes have included in 2020 securing a 10-year deal with the US Marine Corps to perform scheduled and unscheduled maintenance work on its fleet of 66 KC-130J tankers. Gosh, that's quite a uh, early withdrawal, isn't it, I think, of these mm. aircraft. And, of course, what you have to remember is that uh, a lot of jobs depend on the maintenance and upkeep of these, I would imagine. And, obviously, Marshalls in Cambridge is a, a very uh, very key part of that. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's see what happens. Yeah, that's uh, that's right. There's the RAF. I think has 13 uh, C-130Js dash 30s in service. So, um, I, I I just looked it up. There's about 240 uh, C-130Js of different variants all over the world. Uh, obviously, with the with the U.S. Air Force operating about close to 500 of uh, no 428 total. Yeah, so there's probably about 600 total. Um, and uh, 
for a company like Marshall's, that's a huge part of their business, right? And I've been, I used to drive past their facility quite a few times going over into Cambridge and uh, you would see them just lined up out there and they've been a, a long-standing C-130. Um, yeah, make sure uh, you get these numbers software. right, please, by by the way, Armando, because I'm already in trouble with APG. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Those guys have nothing to complain about. <laughs> can't even spell number. Oh, oh <laughs> no. <laughs> wow, okay. I, I... I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, back to yeah, idea. once again, as always, if anybody no, does for- have, no, if anybody does have any complaints, obviously it's uh, I am very very annoyed at uh, airlinepilotguy.com. Obviously, don't <laughs> uh, don't. Uh, well, well, let's don't, just don't, say don't. that there's more C130Js in, in active service than you can count with an abacus, Captain Jeff. <laughs> I mean, anyway. I, 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 I mean, um, yeah, shall we, shall, shall we dig ourselves out of this little hole, Carlos? Uh, we have a final yes. part to share with everyone. We do. It is the final part of uh, the awesome George Lee interview. And this is the final part, number 12, this is. And uh, in this final part, George talks to Nick about leaving the world of gliding behind his faith and answers that final question we always ask our guests. Now, you ran your last course at uh, Plane Soaring in 2011. Uh, what have you been doing since? Well, big decision, Nick. Marin knew that I wasn't really quite ready to give up gliding, but there were pointers. Uh, on the practical side, the bitumen strips had really, in fact, they'd gone by their use by date, frankly. And I did ask for a quote to get them resurfaced. And the figure was such that I said, well, that's an easy decision. We're not doing that. <laughs> so um, Marin's health was heading south. And that was a major, major factor. We had a, a married daughter in town. We were about 20 minutes out of town. And she had married a local man and they actually had a little a little child, which was wonderful against our expectation, certainly. So these were the three main factors. Um, so we built a house in town and here we are on the western edge of Dolby Town. It was a big decision. And I'll be honest, I grieved, I guess, for the loss of gliding. I've been doing it more than 50 years, a better part of 55 years. And although I might get the odd chance of a ride in a two-seater, I, ha- I have by now fully accepted that it's over. And uh, doing, you know, new house with everything associated with that, there's a lot of practical stuff to be going on with. And um, we're part of a, a church and there's all stuff associated there, et cetera. So boredom has not been a problem, Nick, that's for very sure. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Now, you did manage to fill some of your time uh, writing a book with uh, the lovely title Hold Fast to Your Dreams. goes into a lot more detail than we've been able to cover in our chat here. Uh, and I commend it to our audience. How did you come up with the title? Way back when I won the Worlds in Finland, I re- after that I received an invitation to a secondary girls' school. I can't remember where it was, I'm sorry in the south of England somewhere. Anyway, after I'd given my presentation and I gave it an RAF uniform, I thought that was appropriate. They were leading me back through a classroom to to the the car park. We came through this classroom and I'm looking, glancing around as I went and I saw this picture on the wall and there was a picture of a seagull in flight and it caught my eye and uh, they could see I was attracted to it. So I actually wandered over to it to have a closer look and see the words that were written on it. And the words were actually written by a black American poet, maybe a writer as well, called Langston Hughes. Never heard of him before. And the words read, hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, they become a broken winged bird that cannot fly. And that really got into me, (laughs) it did. It really got into me I, and, and I thought, right. So they actually, would you believe, they took the picture off the wall after my departure and they wrapped it up, parceled it up and sent it to me as a gift. And I thought, how, how, 
How beautiful is that? What a lovely gesture. That's absolutely and then, brilliant. You know, the dreams, Nick, I've had many dreams, but the, the three main ones I feel have been accomplished. First of all, I wanted to become a pilot, accomplish that. Next big dream, I wanted to win a world championships in gliding, achieve that. And then the final dream, setting up the plane soaring courses and putting back into the movement by the coaching vehicle. And I, and I achieved that. So the title for the book, first of all, I set up a website um, and that's still there. I've left it there. It's called holdfasttodreams.com. But when I sent things over to the publisher, um, he immediately changed the title from Hold Fast to Dreams to Hold Fast to Your Dreams to personalize it more. And I thought, well, okay, that's fair enough. So I didn't change the website anyway. So that's how I came to the title. Well, that's absolutely brilliant. Now, you mentioned that you have a lovely church uh, in your town, and I know that faith has always played a significant role in your life, particularly uh, since becoming a committed Christian. Um, How has it affected your view of the world we live in? Well, that's a profound question, Nick. It really is. Uh, in all honesty, I've always believed right from my childhood. That was the sort of family background I was brought up in. So I've always believed. But it wasn't until a Christian meeting in Hong Kong in 1993 where my life changed dramatically. The Holy Spirit touched me very powerfully during that meeting, totally unexpectedly. And frankly, my life hasn't been the, cha uh, the same since. It completely changed. I felt a greater love and compassion for people. Reading the Bible has just opened it up completely to me. And some, I, Marin and I have been elders now in our church for about 12 years. Some five or six years ago, I actually did a course on to become a hospital chaplain, or as they call it these days, pastoral caring. So before the COVID hit, I was doing each week uh, hospital and aged care visiting. And I know that's something I was meant to be doing. It's been very rewarding as well as extremely challenging at times. But um, so faith has been central in my life and absolutely central since that moment in Hong Kong in 93. And I have an inner peace rising from the knowledge that I will spend eternity with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's number one, absolutely. And it makes everything else, frankly, relatively insignificant. And it's especially wonderful to have that assurance given the state of everything going on in the world right now. Well, I was going to ask you if you were to single out one event, which do you think of most fondly? I think you've already answered that question. But looking back on your life of achievement, how do you feel now that it's all behind you? Well, and when one is young, one doesn't think about this point in life. But here I am at it at the age of 75 and look back over the going down memory lane again with you. Nick has been absolutely wonderful. When I reflect back on everything, frankly, I feel a bit overwhelmed about everything that's actually happened. I mean, it's been extraordinary. So much has happened. Quite, quite amazing. But there are three areas that I guess I feel particularly thankful for. One is, number one, God for giving me the gift of faith and for turbocharging that faith in 1993. Secondly, my wife, Marin, she is the most wonderful woman, the most wonderful wife a man could ever have. She has stood by me through thick and thin, through the good, the bad and the ugly. And we've only hit on some of it in this in this little chat together. And it needs to be said that the World Championships were every two years normally. The one in 81 was an exception because of the Olympics in 1980, so they put it back a year. But normally every two years. And the middle year in between them, we're talking about a pre-world competition for the venue that to, to come. So Marin, bless her, here I am in the Air Force, nearly all my leave is going on gliding, 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 and weekends is gliding, gliding, gliding. She did do some herself, I'm glad to say. She, she went solo and had about 30 hours worth, but never, worth, well, never went cross country. She was quite happy to fly locally. So Marin, I owe her so much, and we still have a very, very strong marriage. Can't thank her enough. And the final area of thanks, 
just that I've had the honor and the, of flying classic aircraft. The Hunter, the Phantom and the 747, I would regard each of those as being absolutely classic aircraft. So in, in summary, Nick, I've had a blessed, privileged life and I know it and I'm very, very thankful. Well said, George, well said. So in conclusion, uh, perhaps, looking back at the 16-year-old RAF apprentice from Monkstown, County Dublin, nobody could have imagined how the life of this young man would blossom into what George has become today. George climbed a very steep hill to become a pilot in the Air Force and then excelled at flying one of the Cold War's most fearsome fighters. Uh, but you also had skills so finely tuned that you could dance your craft on laughter-silvered wings and do a hundred things you've not dreamed of, if you'll excuse me for stealing from a very famous poem. Um, your achievements in the Air Force, in the airline industry, and in the world of gliding are legendary, which in my world makes you a legend, George. It's been an enormous pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, but the Plain Talking podcast has a tradition of asking its guests one final question. Now, if reality and money wasn't a barrier, which aircraft, past, present, military or civilian, that you've never flown before, you'd like to fly? Oh, Nick, that I've never flown before. Well, I don't. I just added that bit because you've flown some great aeroplanes, and I, I uh, <laughs> go on. You could, you you could, you could include the ones you've flown. <laughs> well, I loved the Phantom. I really did because it was a, a machine that was capable of fulfilling a mission, and the, the stories of Vietnam the survivability, ruggedness was proven tremendously in that war. But the two that just stick with me so greatly are the Hunter and the F-15. One, you know, from completely different eras, of course. But I love both of those tremendously. And now the, the way fighter aircraft have moved on so much. I was talking to an F-18 uh, instructor, actually, in the RAAF recently, who's a glider pilot. And we we're talking about the, the, the fighter world and he's flying the F-18. And he was talking about how things have advanced. And he said, in turn, the F-18 is no sluggard, as you know, Nick. But when he said, as far as the Raptor is concerned, forget it, forget it. And I thought, wow, has it moved on that much? You know, it really is. And, and in the airline world, of course, things have become much more automated. I really enjoyed the classic, flying with a flight engineer, another set of eyes out the cockpit and management of systems, all that sort of stuff. I, I, I enjoyed that very much. And I, I wouldn't have, you know, talking to guys who went on to the 777 from the classic, it just says, you know, remove their brain. They don't have to think, it sort of does everything for them. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm very happy to have flown the aircraft that I flew with all their challenges and pilot skills and seaman's eye and the weaponeering to, yeah. To, to bring to the table. That's a great answer. And many thanks indeed for being our guest today, George. Thank you, Nick. I've enjoyed it greatly. I mean, wow. <laughs> wow, what an incredible series that is. I've, I'm really sad that it's come to an end. It was great. And uh, hats off to Nick, who put together a fantastic line of questioning. Uh, thank you so much to George Lee, MBE. Uh, I'm going to miss saying that. There's something quite cool about saying George Lee, MBE, mm. isn't there? <laughs> but uh, yeah, great series. And thank you for asking that question, of course, which uh, we always need uh, need the answer to, don't we? <laughs> but uh, some great choices in there, actually. And I, think, I think it's quite nice actually that his favorite aircraft that he's ever flown of all time are the ones that were that he was flying i think that's great yeah i couldn't agree more yeah i mean yeah, I, we've had a couple guests here and there that that have a similar response so you know what i've flown a p-51 yeah that was my dream aircraft <laughs> yeah. yeah i can i can be a uh carlos what did you say a, a corpse an aviation corpse so they could be six feet under. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, uh, we're going to move on then before someone gets sued. And uh, the <laughs> the uh, we've actually while we've been on air, we've had a lovely message in on the WhatsApp number plus four four seven five seven two two four nine one six six. And this one comes from Jacob in Australia. Thank you, Jacob. And uh, we were talking earlier in the show, weren't we, about you know tough times for the airlines and all that kind of thing. And obviously, I mean, we've said before in previous shows, obviously Australia's lockdown. At the time, everybody thought was very, very extreme, didn't they? I mean, they were sort of, you know, they were the first to go into full lockdown and they were in lockdown for a long, long time. Uh, anyway, the message that Jacob has sent in says, Good morning slash evening all. Uh, just thought I'd share a bit of good news. As you may or may, know, may or may not know, I'm a captain for a large regional airline down here in Australia. And after 49 weeks, 49 weeks of wow. being stood down from work, as of Monday, we are all going back to... To work full time with the vaccine slowly making its way through the community i really think that we have turned the corner at least down here in australia anywhere and uh things are slowly going back to somewhat normal anyway just thought i'd pop in and share the news and say hi to everyone all the very best guys from jacob i mean i think a little cheer is in order on that one isn't it guys that's Hurrah! absolutely fantastic absolutely. Yeah. great news uh so pleased to hear that jacob and uh, let's hope uh, that in the coming months that this will be a similar story for all of our friends who are in the aviation industry True. where that they'll you know they can sort of start going back to let's be honest the job they all already you know love doing so uh, uh, a bit of good news i think really to start wrapping the show up on carlos yes we have had some listener feedback as well haven't we uh, to the show guys have we, we have yes Yes, yeah. we had uh, can, some... Do you mind if I read yeah. one of them? Yeah, you go. You go, Amanda. You go. Let, let me... I couldn't be any more proud to read this one, actually. This is from one of our listeners, from Laura, and it's actually regarding the uh, Women in Aviation special that we just did. Um, first of all, thank you to the ladies for letting the B team back in. <laughs> they, <laughs> they did this like they've been doing it for years, and we're still just, you know... Uh, amateurs looking for 50% accuracy. But uh, <laughs> this piece of feedback said, uh, hi everyone, I wanted to share my thoughts about the excellent Women in Aviation special episode. I wanted to echo what Ariel said during the show. It's quite special that all of you gentlemen are willing to hand over the show to an all women host, cast of hosts. Uh, I haven't come across another show who has done that. And I agree with Ariel, it does say something great about all of you guys as hosts. Thank you for intentionally creating a space where women are valued. It's something we need to see happen more often. Uh, to Dr. Steph, Megan, Ariel, and Jody, wonderful show. I know Dr. Steph is used to being a host, but I really thought everyone did a top-notch uh, professional job. Uh, especially appreciated Megan being one of the hosts. I think it was so cool to include her because there are a lot of women out there who are spouses to pilots of some sort. Uh, who are important in supporting aviation and don't always get represented. Everyone seems like just super cool people. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, anyway, I hope to have a chance to meet each one of them at some point. This is a show which I wish I would have had uh, access to growing up. Back then, I hardly ever saw women role models who were present in a male-dominated field. Not only did I love all the different perspectives and experiences represented by the hosts, but the video segments did a great job of rounding out the many different options for women who want to pursue aviation. Kathy's interview at the end was also a really interesting segment. I love how she reinforced how important it is to share the stories of women aviators. Personally, the show really inspired me to keep searching for my own place in the aviation world, for which I am really appreciative. It's been uh, easy to get bogged down a bit by the past year's events, but the stories uh, shared help provide fresh motivation to keep moving forward and pursue my interests in aviation and aerospace, even if I don't exactly know what that might look like. Lastly, to John and Matt and anyone else I may not be aware of, uh, thanks for all the planning work behind the scenes and to the production, editing, tech before, during, and after the show. I know there were a few hiccups, but as always, they were taken care of, and the quality of the show, of the show reflects your hard work. I really hope another show like this happens in the future. Thanks again for making it happen. Take care. Laura. 
Oh, thank what you. What a lovely email. Laura. I mean, yes, we, in answer to that question, I mean, we very much plan to do a, a similar mm. special. But I think John especially will need to have a lie down in several darkened rooms uh, before we do that. Because, <laughs> uh, as I say, as Laura alluded to there, there was so much work that went on behind the scenes on that. But I think I, I, think I speak on behalf of it. It's certainly something that we're all very proud of. I, I think uh, it was a great true, show. Yeah. Thank you so you know, very much. And to we've everyone. received so many fantastic segments and then reports Replies. I mean, yeah. um, our producer, John, shot so many emails out to different organizations and different notable women in aviation. And we actually replied or, or we received more replies than we could fit. And as it was, it was a three hour show. Mm. Um, so I'm looking forward to playing some of those out at different times throughout the year. Yeah. I know I've uh, actually scheduled an interview with um, a wonderful lady, uh, uh, Brenda Robinson, who runs an aviation camp. She was the first uh, African-American female pilot in the Navy. And uh, she lives right here in Charlotte, North Carolina. So I'm going to schedule an interview with her, I believe, on May 21st. And we're oh, going to probably record that. But but it was just uh, so indicative of, of the fantastic uh, and positive responses that we received. Absolutely. We've also had uh, a email for as well from Alan. Uh, Alan says, further to your most recent podcast, requesting uh, looking for feedback on the Women in Aviation podcast, I cannot compliment the four ladies enough for the show. John and Matt get credit for the behind the scenes work also. Well done. Really informative, well presented, and I would love to hear more like this. As a father of two young girls, one who wants to be an astronaut and the other a princess, I will look forward to uh, look for role models like these for our ladies as examples that you can do whatever it makes to make you happy or absolute success in my opinion for the show we need more visibility for women in aviation like jody recounted in her air show autograph booth story to break the mold that flying is a male only world and to get the number of female pilots above six percent keep up the good work stay safe and wishing good health to mama smith oh best regards <laughs> alan so thank you for that thank you alan oh yeah it was it was it was good uh, and th- keep keep the feedback coming in guys it really is because we want to we, we really want to tell uh you know to highlight to the wonderful ladies uh, what an incredible job they did so do please keep them coming so uh, week ahead what's coming up um on next week's show any uh, any Oh, apparently there is one more piece of feedback we're being told. Yeah, guys, I, I, I'll be happy to read that one. Um, yep, this, this one's from listener Becky, actually. it's uh, She says, as a result of last week's Women in Aviation podcast, you gained a new subscriber and a fan. Thank you for that. I found out about the show from Dr. Steph when she plugged it on that other, no, the Airline Pilot Guy podcast. <laughs> While I'm not a pilot, I am a fan of all things aviation, and I would like to hear more of uh, all these women Uh, these all women podcasts as a transgender woman i would suggest that you might want to consider having transgender pilot Uh, two pilots come to mind Uh, the first is kelly lepley who is a 747 cargo pilot Uh, and actually she sent us a link to a uh, a ted talk that kelly did Um, and the second one is jessica taylor a commercial airline pilot who also did an interview that's available on youtube and i think we'll get those um, either published somehow or at least shared or maybe we'll just reach out to them and do Mm. another special so um, yeah, like Matt said, keep the positive feedback coming. Or negative, but it's mostly positive. We know that. Yeah, yeah. It's more likely to be read out if it's positive, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, no, I, I get it been brilliant. As I say, it was it was a real fun project to be involved in and uh, looking forward to many more. I know we've got a, um, a military one in the works, which we're quite excited about. We do. We're... we're... We haven't nailed down a date quite okay. yet, and now we've got some potential co-hosts that have some great military experience. Um, and Nev's, yeah, just, I don't Nev's know. just very excited because it means he gets another week off. He's That's himself. Right. <laughs> oh, man, I can't wait to have Nev on just for <laughs> to that entire show. I may just do an, an entire story that has no uh, subject, verb, no adjectives, no nothing. It's just all acronyms. <laughs> And then, and then we'll see if if we can all get through the end of it and guess what what the story was okay. about. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, enough of upsetting Uncle Nev. I think that's the, <laughs> that's the thing. We I need to start wrapping lost. up, guys. We we've hit the two hour mark already. Seriously. I know. Social media links then quickly: Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. 
search uh, for plaintalkinguk.com or plaintalkinguk a whatsapp number to get your picture on the green screen behind matt plus four four seven five seven two two four nine one six six also don't forget our website all the w's dot plaintalkinguk.com on there you'll find uh, all the shops you could buy t-shirts and mugs as well uh, for yourself there's loads to choose from on there and also the Amazon links on there if you want to do your shopping via that link, which uh, I will do this weekend. Winning. And also, uh, if you want to become a patron of the show, you can find the links on there to become a patron to the show. And also, you can also donate to the show through a PayPal link on there as well, which we would very much love as well if you do have a spare few pence laying around. And, uh, yeah, so thank you uh, for one and all for joining us this evening. Big thanks to everyone in the chat room this evening for joining us. Thank you very much for taking time at your Friday nights. And don't forget as well, if you are listening to the show as an audio downloader, but, make but, sure you give us a little review on the site you use to download but, us th- from. Thanks, APG Show. A real treat. Thanks. Uh, that was lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. He said, he said, oh my God, isn't it time for this mess to end? I mean, you know. So, fun. quick run through. <laughs> Matt, what are you doing this week? Uh, not doing a lot this week, but I did want to plug the fact that I'm back on the radio. Uh, you can listen to Park Radio Disc by, uh, if you're not here in the UK, you can listen to it using your smart speaker in the States or wherever else it is. Uh, if you are in the Waveney Valley, you can listen to it on 105.2 FM. Um, but uh, shameless yes, plug. a shameless plug, absolutely. Park Radio Disc. Did I say that out loud? Park Radio <laughs> Disc. Uh, and I'm on uh, uh, Good Friday and Easter Monday, 12 till 3. And I'm live terrible anyway mr bounds what are ye up to next week back out on the road i'm pleased to say Woo-hoo! later in the week uh into uh, london and peterborough as well mm. uh, not very far from you guys um so yeah looking forward to doing that again and hopefully some international travel uh one of these days maybe <laughs> later in may not quite sure yet. maybe I'm yeah i'll <laughs> see how that goes yeah. so armando you obviously top us every week with what you're doing so carry on well, it actually depends on the weather. Um, if the weather is nice, then I think I'm going to see Steph at the drop zone tomorrow and then uh, fly some skydivers myself on Sunday. Next week, I get to fly an Aztec. Never flown one. That's pretty fun. Ooh. Um, and other than that, just uh, hanging around at the house. Keep us posted. Pictures posted. Well done. Always. <laughs> good, good. And John, what are you doing next week? Oh, thank you. Well done. Thank you. So a big thanks as well. Not forgetting John, our producer, John, for all his hard work in the background on the show. Thank you to you. And thanks to all our hosts for all the hard work this week on the show. And that's it. So from me, Carlos, here in my home studio, from Nev in his glorious studio in Buckinghamshire, from Armando in his palatial studio mansion, and uh, from Matt in the P2K Master Suite studio, and from John in his studio, Take care, everyone. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. See you next Friday. Bye-bye.